Hi, welcome to Archaeonomy. This is a military history video discussing the attack on Rangiafia and the Battle of Hyrene, engagements fought during the Waikato Campaign of the New Zealand Wars in 1864. Following the Battle of Rangaruri, the British Army advanced up the Waipa River, till they encountered the formidable line of pa we refer to as the Patarangi Line, that defended the agricultural heartland of the Waikato. They camped at Terore, where they suffered supply line issues due to the wrecking of the Avon, issues that were only resolved when the new steamer, the Kohiroa, arrived on the river. This old army sketch map isn't to scale, so I'll switch to a Google Earth aerial for you. A battle was fought at Waiare, on the Mangapiko stream, that began when Māori ambushed a party of soldiers bathing there, and both sides then sent in reinforcements. In the days immediately before the Battle of Hyrene, Cameron's army prepared to slip around the end of the Patarangi line in a stealthy night march. At 11pm on the 20th of February 1864, a force of 1,226 soldiers formed up, made up of troops from the 65th and 70th Regiments, the Forest Rangers... Royal Navy, Royal Marines, Royal Engineers, Royal Artillery, and the Colonial Defence Force Cavalry. The scabbards and bridle chains of the cavalry were all wrapped in cloth to silence them. Lieutenant Colonel Gamble was with them, and he wrote, The night was very favourable for the march, moonlight overcast, and with drizzling rain as we started. No tents having been struck till just dark, there was every possibility that the move would be effected unobserved by the enemy. The enemy's positions blocked the main road from Terore to Tiawamutu and Rangiafia, the latter being the chief source of supply. Our line of march led across the Mangapiko River at Waiari and followed a scarcely defined cattle track over a fern ridge, came out to a good dray road used by the natives in conveying produce from the Rangiafia neighbourhood. The troops were extended on the line of march over a long distance, the track not admitting of a greater front than a single man, the ground on either side being overgrown with fern, varying from one to three to four feet high, until we reached the dry road. Here it was discovered that one company of the 65th, the 70th Regiment, and the whole of the cavalry who were in the rear became separated by losing the connection, and did not regain the track for two hours. They passed within 1,400 yards of Patarangi Pa undetected, and could hear the Maori sentries calling to one another. The force reached Tiaumutu shortly after daylight. Cameron dispatched the cavalry ahead into Rangiafia, completely surprising the settlement, that was principally occupied by women and children. Twelve Māori were killed, and twelve men and thirty-three women and children taken prisoner, according to Gamble. Five British and colonial soldiers would die from this action, including Lieutenant Colonel Nixon, the commander of the Colonial Defence Force Cavalry. Almost all of the casualties came from a single event in the attack. During the storming of the village, six men and the youth were seen entering a fare, which is a traditional Māori house, in this case having a deeply depressed floor, no windows, and walls made of wooden slabs. A cavalry trooper was sent in to take them prisoner, and he was shot dead in the doorway. The other troopers fired into the fiery through the walls, and soon it was surrounded as the infantry caught up to the cavalry. Translators were sent to the doorway by Colonel Nixon to try to arrange their surrender, but they were fired upon, so the troops continued to pour bullets into the house. A 65th Regiment soldier tried to rescue the fallen trooper, but the bedroll on his backpack got caught in the narrow doorway and he was shot in the head. Colonel Nixon, who was with the troops outside, was shot through the lung, mortally wounded by yet another gunshot from the doorway. Incensed, soldiers set the neighbouring fires on fire, hoping the flames would jump to the occupied fire. Captain Von Tempsky arrived at the scene and had a group of his forest rangers try to storm it. They crowded in the doorway but couldn't see anything in the darkness. A cavalry trooper who was with them was shot in the head, and a forest ranger mortally wounded in the hip, and they abandoned their effort. The flames caught the fire, and three Māori, one unarmed and two armed, fled the burning building only to be gunned down by the vengeful soldiers. The officers were furious at the shooting of the unarmed man, and berated the troops for disobeying their orders not to fire on him. The charred bodies of seven Māori and the trooper were found in the burnt ruins. With the village burnt down, the soldiers returned to Tiaumutu, where they met up with reinforcements from Terore. Having lost the villages of Tiaumutu and Rangiafia, and with their defensive line outflanked and their supply lines cut, the garrison at Paturangi launched a counterattack, now known as the Battle of Hyrene. Early on the 22nd, the British advanced pickets reported that 500 to 700 Māori from Paturangi, Pico Pico and Rangiatia were marching towards Rangiafia and at midday reported that around 400 warriors were entrenching themselves at the site of an old pa on Hyrene Hill, 
Hyrene is a Maori transliteration of Ireland. There was an old line of ditch and bank fencing that ran north-south on the hill, between Rangiafia and Tiamutu. Reports also came in that the Patarangi line had been abandoned. Cameron gathered his force and marched to attack the position immediately, before the entrenchments could be completed. They marched down the narrow dray road, hemmed in either side by high fern. The Maori had a line of skirmishers a mile in front of their position, taking cover behind a gorse hedge, 500 yards from the advanced picket. Cameron dispatched two companies of the 50th and 70th regiments in skirmishing order in order to take the hedgerow, which they successfully did, and the Maori retreated, harried by the cavalry. The ditching bank fence on Hyrene Hill had been modified by the Maori. They deepened the ditch and built up the bank into a strong parapet, constructing a stake fence surrounding it, and blocked the road with a section of rifle trench. On their right flank was a deep swamp, and thick bush was on their left. The Maori force contained a diverse mixture of tribes, various Waikato groups, many Ngāti Maniapoto, some Ngāti from Tauranga, and nearly a hundred Uruwera warriors. Amongst the Ngāti was a man who had become infamous in 1865, Kereopa Terao, known later as the Eye Swallower. Having driven off the skirmishes, the main body of troops advanced down the road. Two six-pound Armstrongs were set up on a ridge nearby, and they opened fire on the entrenchments, while the 50th and 70th Regiment skirmishers exchanged fire with the defenders. Cameron had the main body of the 50th form up into a four-wide column on the road, with the 65th and 70th in support. They couldn't adopt a wider formation because the dense firm was hemming them in. The cavalry was gathered on the right, ready to ride down any fleeing Maori. The column of the 50th advanced on the line of entrenchments, commanded by Colonel Weir. The soldiers' hobnailed boots on the dirt road actually stirred up a cloud of dust so large it acted like a smokescreen. The forest rangers under Von Temsky moved around the left to attack the Maori right flank. Weir had a small storming party of 20 men under Lieutenant White break off from the main body and charge, drawing the enemy fire which was heavy, but relatively ineffective, then immediately followed this up with his main force that fixed bayonets and charged the trenches. An anonymous forest ranger wrote, The Armstrongs were sending their shells screeching over us, and the Maori bullets were cutting down the fern near me with an even swathe as you could cut with a slash hook. We were lying down within 300 yards of the enemy. At last the charge was sounded, and away we went, the whole of us. We rangers making for the Maori's right flank, the 50th regiment on our right for the centre. With a great cheer, the 50th swept splendidly up the parapet with bayonets at the charge. We on the left stormed the Maori line on even terms of them. We had no bayonets, but we used our revolvers for the close quarters work. The Maori broke and ran before the soldiers could get their bayonets to bear, and were pursued by the cavalry who cut down quite a few fleeing Maori. Some disappeared into the nearby swamp, while others fled to the next hill where Rangiafia Church stood. Cameron quickly formed up again to take that position, but it was promptly abandoned. The Maori forces fell back to their stronghold of Titiki or Ihinairangi at Mangatotari. The British and colonial force lost three men killed and 15 wounded. Maori casualties were estimated at around 30 killed. Some of the wounded were captured and treated at the field hospital at Tiamutu. The troops captured quite a bit of loot, as the Maori had fled with only their weapons, leaving a convoy of supplies. There was an argument between Weir and Von Temsky over it. Weir tried to arrest the junior officer, but the whole affair was soon laughed off. The forest rangers, who are infamous for looting everything that isn't nailed down and half the stuff that is, returned to camp. Von Temsky wrote, There were men representing a walking museum of fowls, strung and hung all over their persons. There were men having the carcasses of pigs strapped to their bodies. One even carried a live young sow, baby-wise, in his arms, restraining its desperate struggles and screams by the strength of a powerful arm. There were men mounted on Maori horses. One of them, my half-caste Sergeant Southie, decorated with feathers used at the Maori war dance. The whole two companies bristled with Maori spears, tomahawks, double-barreled guns, and so forth. I myself had a magnificent long-handled tomahawk given to me by one of my men, who picked it up on the battlefield. I gave it to General Cameron. Cameron's next focus in the Waikato would be an advance up the Waikato River itself, towards Titiki or Ihinarangi, and Cameron gathered a fearsome siege train for the attack of that pa. These events are still controversial today. Some believe that the attack on Rangiafia was a war crime, a ruthless attack on an undefended civilian target, while others argue it's one of the best moves Cameron ever made, 
avoiding a likely bloody, near-suicidal assault at Paturangi Pa, seizing the grain basket of the Waikato, and forcing said fearsome Pa to be abandoned in one swift move. That's where I'll stop for now. If you like this video and you haven't seen them already, please check out my videos on Rangariri and Gate Pa. The New Zealand Wars was a pivotal event in the formation of New Zealand as a country. I feel I don't get anywhere near the attention that they deserve. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers!